diversity represents the richness of our communities. And we must stand together against all forms of irrationality and manipulation that lead to hatred, be it political populism, radical nationalism, or religious fundamentalism. From climate change to spreading conflict and outbreaks of disease, we need regional and global institutions more than we've ever done before. And this, I believe, to strengthen our collective response. Pluralist societies are not accidents of history. They are products of decision and public investment. My long experience has taught me that whatever our background, what unites us is far greater than what divides us. Your Highness, Ms. Mengiste, Excellencies, Friends of the Global Center for Pluralism, I'm delighted to welcome you to the eighth annual Pluralism Lecture, featuring award-winning novelist Maza Mengiste. You will see that I'm standing outside the headquarters of the Global Center for Pluralism here in Ottawa at 330 Sussex Drive. I wanted to begin here to acknowledge that this building sits on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Unceded, meaning the Algonquin have not given us the rights to be on the land where Ottawa is located. To this day, the Algonquin remain the stewards of this land. Land acknowledgements such as this remind us of the important process of learning, listening and action that is central for reconciliation and core to pluralism. It reminds us that Canada's reconciliation process with Indigenous peoples continues, as do processes like this around the world. It reminds us that many societies struggle with the ongoing legacy of colonialism, as do the Algonquin Nation. And it reminds us of the importance of understanding and acknowledging history through narrative and storytelling to help us make changes towards a more inclusive and equitable society. Thank you for joining us today. This is our first time presenting the lecture virtually. And as you can see, in line with Ontario's public health guidance, I am now speaking to you from my own home. We recognize that it is challenging to cultivate a sense of connection across this digital divide. Connection is so important to establishing the shared understanding that is integral to pluralism. By co-presenting today's event with the University of British Columbia in Vancouver and working with our media partner, CBC Ideas, we have tried to bring together communities across Canada from east to west. We are also live streaming this event to Facebook to facilitate participation from a worldwide audience. Today's event will likely be the most globally representative audience we have ever seen at an annual lecture. We welcome all of you from all corners and hope that today's lecture offers you the opportunity to reflect and learn from one of our contemporary era's great storytellers about how to build and strengthen societies where everyone belongs. The Global Center for Pluralism was founded as a partnership between His Highness the Aga Khan and the Government of Canada. Nous travaillons avec des leaders politiques des éducateurs et des bâtisseurs communautaires du monde entier pour faire valoir le pouvoir transformateur du pluralisme et le mettre en œuvre. The center is founded on the premise that diversity in society at every level is a demographic fact. Pluralism refers to the actions we take to respond positively to these differences, to see them as the basis for a more successful and prosperous society. For pluralism to truly flourish in society, we need not only the structures in place, our hardware of laws and policies, constitutions, and so forth, but critically, we need the software that will underpin our systems, our cultural norms and perceptions, our narratives about who belongs, the stories we tell about our own history. All of these together weave the fabric of pluralism that makes a society genuinely inclusive. The work we do at the Centre focuses on these actions and decisions needed to advance both better structural and cultural responses to diversity, 
whether understanding and measuring pluralism through our global pluralism monitor, giving teachers the tools to act as pluralist educators and build schools as incubators for pluralism. Our work centers always on informing the concrete actions that are needed to advance positive responses to diversity across all of society. This annual pluralism lecture is one such initiative. It provides us an opportunity to learn from distinguished speakers like Ms. Mengiste, whose writing tackles issues at the very heart of pluralism, collective memory, historical narratives, belonging, and identity. Following the lecture, we are thrilled to have Ms. Nala Ayad, host and producer of CBC Ideas, joining us from Toronto to open a conversation with Ms. Mengiste and take questions from our audience. We will also have the opportunity to hear music performed by members of the University of British Columbia community, accompanied by their own reflections on history and memory. Finally, Dr. Santa J. Ono, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia, will offer closing remarks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ms. Mengiste, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of His Highness the Aga Khan and the entire board of the Global Centre for Pluralism to our eighth annual Pluralism Lecture. La conférence aujourd'hui est exceptionnelle puisque c'est la toute première fois depuis la première conférence en 2012 lorsque nous avons accueilli la présidente du, Kiri, du Kiristan, Madame Rosa Otombaeva, à Ottawa, que nous ne pouvons pas nous retrouver en personne. Il s'agit de la première conférence depuis que la pandémie de Covid-19 s'est déferlée sur la population humaine de notre planète, laquelle a encore des répercussions à l'échelle mondiale aujourd'hui. The pandemic and the inequalities that it has magnified are a stark reminder of the urgency with which we must come together across our differences to build a more inclusive society. This is also the first lecture to feature a speaker from the world of the literary arts, an important yet often overlooked arena for advancing pluralism. These differences make today's lecture particularly unique and memorable, while also being tinged with sadness. The opportunity to exchange with one another directly about the reflections and ideas that these lectures inspire will be deeply missed. However, technology has allowed us to gather in a virtual way, and I encourage you to continue the conversations initiated by today's lecture with those around you, your families, friends, colleagues and communities. Engaging with one another to build mutual understanding and appreciation across our differences the kind of dialogue which is at the heart of pluralism must continue. There are important lessons to be learned from the past year as the pandemic has transformed our societies and our institutions. Our ability to work remotely has shown new approaches to reducing our climate footprint and, for example, brought education to remote communities. These and other positive outcomes have the potential to strengthen our ambition for greater equity 
in and across our societies. Today's speaker, Maza Mengiste, has contributed in significant ways to bridging divides by illuminating the struggles and lives of individuals and communities that may be different from our own. How we talk about history at school, at home, and through literature is a powerful part of how we create a sense of belonging and shared destiny as a society. Ms. Mengiste's work reminds us of the hidden stories and voices that we must seek to amplify. Her award-winning works of historical fiction, Beneath the Lion's Gaze and The Shadow King, which was shortlisted for the 2020 Booker Prize, shed light on experiences of migration, war and exile. Through her characters, readers embark on a journey through Ethiopia's history of political tensions, violence and occupation. We see the emotional and social toll that conflict can take, mirrored today in so many countries and societies, from Syria to Yemen and Myanmar. Her writing also bears important witness to the strength and empowerment of people, particularly women, in conflict. Born in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Ms. Mengiste lived in Nigeria and Kenya before moving to the United States. Her global perspective gives her work a resonance well beyond the Horn of Africa. Her writing considers how historical narratives and collective memory are shaped over time. History and memory are central to pluralism. We see this in many countries where education is critical to building a pluralistic society. And in Canada, where the historical narrative is key in advancing reconciliation with indigenous peoples. While inclusive historical narratives can reflect a country's diversity and foster belonging, an exclusionary narrative can deepen tensions and divisions between groups. These dynamics shape societal interactions for generations and can be challenging to change. Around the world, societies are grappling with the immense challenge of rebuilding after the pandemic. The recovery must be guided by principles of respect, empathy for one another, and to secure a more equitable, just and prosperous future for us all. Ms. Mengiste's writing helps us reflect on the important lessons about recovery, peace building and belonging to be learned from the past. As we face numerous challenges in building pluralism, we need gifted, visionary, empathetic thinkers like herself. Ladies and gentlemen, it is therefore my very great privilege to welcome our pluralism lecturer for 2021, Ms. Maza Mengiste. I own an old black and white photograph of two men standing side by side, inches apart from each other. One is East African and the other Italian. The East African, either Ethiopian or Eritrean, wears frayed shorts so old and worn that large patches of skin gape through the holes. The bottoms are ripped unevenly, narrowing raggedly and stopping at his calves. An oversized jacket sags against his slender frame, the open flaps exposing his bare chest. He squints into the camera with a lowered chin, his mouth a grim line. The Italian beside him is fully clothed with a hat perched at an angle on his head. It shields his face from the worst of the sun, and so he is able to gaze forward undisturbed. Though there are two men here, it is him that the photographer has placed neatly in the middle of the frame. He is the central figure, the one that cuts the vertical photograph in half. I no longer recall where I found this photograph. What I remember instead is the moment of encounter with it, that first jolt of recognition that I was looking at something, even though I could not yet understand what it was. In 1935, Benito Mussolini invaded Ethiopia to colonize the country. It was not fair 
that Britain, France, Germany, Belgium, and other countries had staked a claim on the African continent without Italy. It was, he stated, Italy's right to have a place in the sun. Fascism would establish a second Roman empire on African soil, and it would do so by conquering Ethiopia. I knew all of this when I first encountered this photograph. Though I couldn't be certain of the date, I could make an informed guess that this image was made after the October 1935 invasion. War had likely already started. And though Benito Mussolini declared victory in May 1936, I knew this would prove to be premature. The war would simply shift from traditional confrontations to guerrilla warfare. Perhaps this photograph was made in that chaotic period between the declaration of victory and the start of guerrilla war. Perhaps what I was looking at was an image of instability and uncertainty, the Italians. Maybe the ground that rises sharply behind the two men hides entire armies of Ethiopians waiting for dark to ambush. I cannot do that. I cannot will a narrative onto this picture that probably did not exist. The urge is strong. And while I might be able to excuse myself by pointing to the brutalities of war, and in particular this war, I have to refuse the instinct to protect and maybe save this man. I have to see what is there without smoothing out the rough edges of history. It is too easy to put myself into the photograph and reach into the past to settle the pieces into some reassuring order. It eases confusion. It leaves me satisfied in the present. But it also stops the recursive, nagging contemplations that could lead me to other discoveries. Because it is more difficult to reckon with the unwieldiness of history's omissions. It is uncomfortable to admit that photographs and other documents in other archives only lead to other questions and new uncertainties. Because if we cannot fully know the past, what does it imply about how we imagine the future? We have been taught for so long that an answer must always follow a question. That if we cannot point to a resolution, then we have failed. But what if in that space between knowing and confusion is an entire landscape where something else beyond answers, but equally vital exists? What if cradled within each moment of encounter is a force that can lead us towards real transformation? What if to be disturbed is just one step towards that journey? What if every step forward takes us not into the territory of comfort and certainty, but towards new disruptions and greater leaps? It has taken me a long time to understand what I sensed, but could not initially see. It has taken other photographs and other encounters to recognize the ghosts hovering at the edges of that image. Those invisible threads that connect us to the past, those things we describe in language that is as indefinite and unclear as what we feel in that first moment of encounter. Let me go back for a minute. When Italy invaded Ethiopia, no one really expected Ethiopia to defeat the giant. The army was untrained in tactics of modern warfare. Fascist Italy, on the other hand, was known as one of the largest and most modern military forces in the world. It had perfected air warfare and the use of poison gas to devastating effect in Libya. Still stinging from Italy's defeat in 1896, Mussolini vowed to pour every resource into this war to prove to the world Italy's might. This was, as much as anything, an exhibition of Italian prowess. It was an effort to debunk the stereotypes of Italy as an affable, irresponsible Mediterranean country. 
and present a muscular and violent European power. It was also a carefully orchestrated campaign to promote a cohesive Italian identity, one that melded an idealized masculinity with a devotion to fascism. Young men were encouraged to enlist in the new African adventure with promises of sexually compliant East African women. I have in my possession a certain album. The first photograph depicts a young Ethiopian woman reclining on a rock propped on her elbow and squinting into the sun. A valley unfolds in wide, easy sweeps over her bare shoulders. That she is naked from the waist up is an uncomfortable detail, but it is not unusual. I was taken aback by the careful arrangement of the album. Many photographs included a label with the woman's name. The cities indicated formed a zigzag across Ethiopia. Most included the dates 1936 or 1937. At times, as if it was unacceptable to leave a picture unmarked, a label simply announced the subject as Donna Abyssina, Abyssinian woman. This album was curated, photos organized and meticulously labeled, guided by a patient eye. It was a detailed, carefully crafted story of one man's time in Ethiopia, a way to speak of this great African adventure there was one photo though that was different from the rest. Towards the end of the album is a picture of a woman named Bogalic from Dabra Brahan. Unlike the others, she is fully clothed in her traditional Ethiopian dress. She has a shawl draped across one shoulder and stands with her chin raised, a rifle in her hand. The muzzle is pointed up as if it were aimed at the sky. Bogalic is not afraid, nor is she demure. She looks determined and resilient, strong. She is a startling vision in an album such as this. And for a while, eager to strip away the awful residue of those other photos, I convinced myself that it was a positive portrayal of an African woman. Taken on its own, it might have symbolized the photographer's leanings towards a more complex understanding of women. But I was doing it again. Do you see that? I was reaching into the past to smooth the edges because what I could not immediately accept was that in an album otherwise full of exploitative images of women, the photo of a woman with a gun becomes not a sign of female strength, but a mockery of it. Her implied weakness is exposed by all the other pictures that came before her. This woman, Bogalic, is bound by their fate. They are the ghosts that hover behind her and out of frame. When I looked at her, I needed to see these other women. I needed to see the album. I needed to see the hands that made the album, that pasted the labels, that propped the camera in front of his eye and clicked the shutter to photograph not a woman, but power and manhood. When I looked at her, I needed to see him because what her picture was in essence was a self portrait of this photographer. He was impossible to see without those women, without Bogalic, without the discomfort that brought me back again and again to that first sighting, that first disruption. There he is, not the answer to a question, but a path towards another kind of journey, one that considers what is there, even with all the unknowns and what we can learn from it from him about power and manhood, about ways of seeing and the uncomfortable terrain between confusion and a kind of transformation that provides new questions and urges greater leaps into other 
and charted territory. What does it mean to now see this photographer in this photograph? What does it mean to recognize the many ways that those in power make images of themselves, no matter what is actually standing in front of us, hands folded across a chest while squinting into the sun? Thank you, Maza Mengiste, for your instructive and, and beautiful and haunting lecture, and especially thank you for the very important questions that you raised. Once again, welcome to the Global Center for Pluralism's 2021 annual Pluralism Lecture. My name is Nala Ayed, and I'm host of CBC Ideas from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, and I'm really honored to be with you here today, although in virtual form. I so much would have loved to be with all of you, to be in person, to hear Maza's words. Instead, I'm coming to you from my home in Toronto, and this encounter is being recorded for possible broadcast on CBC Ideas. Before we get to your questions, I have a few questions of my own, Maza, if you'll allow me. Um, and I wanted to begin with uh, one of the questions that you ended with, one that was prompted by the shadow of the photographer in that very first uh, photograph that you discussed. You ask this, what does it mean to recognize the many ways that those in power make images of themselves, no matter what is actually standing in front of us? What has it meant for you? Thank you, Nala, for that question. Um, in recognizing uh, that that is a question to be asked, I um, have come to understand my, my own um, reactions and relationships with, uh, with everything we've been questioning, I feel since the pandemic has come, but also in the last several years, um, where do I stand in relation to 
um, power? Am I its subject? Am I its agitator? Am I um, complicit? Or am I continuing to question and, and uh, force myself into moments of discomfort and look for disruptions? Um, I, I think we, I, I'm, we're speaking, we're no longer in the Trump era, um, but we are very much still in, the, in that historic moment. And I think those are the questions that have been most unsettling and um, instructive for me. Where am I in relation to the, uh, the image making that was happening uh, and continues to happen in this country. One question that kind of occurs to me throughout as I was listening to you is if indeed those images that you brought to us and that you mentioned are actually self-portraits of the Italian soldiers mm -hmm. who, who took them. And if the idea is for us not to be filling in the edges, to resist that impulse, then how is it how is it that we can move past that intention and reconstruct mm -hmm. the other lives that are in those photographs? I think that um, in understanding what was actually being photographed, uh, meaning that every time I would see an image after this discovery that I had made, um, I went back to look at my old photographs, those that I thought were actually amazing and striking images of Ethiopians, those images I think we are all aware of in one way or another of a, a brave chieftain with a gun or a spear staring into the camera looking like he's about to attack. And I used to take that image as something positive, as something that noted the, the power and the strength of that African man, of that Black man. And then once I realized who was making that image, I understood that the, that the narrative that was implied in that is that here I am, an Italian who invaded these people's land, and I can stand in front of a man with a gun from that country and come out alive. And those pictures said everything about power. Um, it forced me to look at that as opposed to trying to guess who that man was. It helped me to understand what was implied in the making of that image? Who is it supposed to refer to? And that led me to a whole other understanding of a narrative of the past. Um, and I think if we, can, if we can look at the past in that way, who was telling us, us these stories and why? I think we have a better sense then of who we've come to be. Uh, in this present moment, and how we can reconstruct different uh, different stories, how we can reconstruct collective memory in order to make a more just future. Um, we're having uh, we're having debates in this country right now about what we can say about the history of slavery in the United States what we can recognize about enslaved human beings, what achievements are worthy to be noted. Um, we have to recognize that those narratives have been constructed by power in the past and they're trying to hold on now. At the same time, there's a very strong message that comes through that you're saying that you, you, what you're counseling is that we must reckon with history rather than reshaping it to kind of fit our present. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, again, beyond resisting the temptation of filling out the edges or smoothing out the, ed the edges, as you say, how do we collectively do that so that we make sure that the history that we read today actually takes into account mm. the voices that were eliminated in the past? Thank you for that. Um, it's a question I've, I, ask, I ask myself a lot while I was writing my novel. And one of the things I had to understand is that we have to give people their complexities we have to give them those traits that maybe we wish they didn't have. Um, we can't smooth the edges of, of the, the people that, that came before us because we want to imagine we're actually better people now. Um, when I was rendering uh, two different characters in my novel, Aster and Hirut, two women who were fighters, it was very easy to make them noble and heroic, generous and, and uh, always just, but that's not the way human beings are. And just because women also fought 
in, in resistance movements um, across the world, it doesn't mean that all those women were actually righteous. Um, that just because a woman is in war doesn't make that war just or her position just. And I think we have to look at those complications so we know to ask uh, those complicated questions in the present. So you mentioned the women who, that drive the, the narrative in the, in the Shadow King, your book. Uh, I'm just wondering how you think the way we think about war shifts when we listen to the voices of women, whether they're fighters or civilians. That is a really wonderful question. I, I was thinking about that as I was writing the book. And what I realized was that once I started sticking close to women, the women in the war, the, the story, the narrative started to shift away from acts of valor, acts of defiance that we often associate with war um, because war has often been masculine and masculinity is defined by triumph, defiance, aggression. And when women get involved, um, it forces a reckoning with war as, um, as something that is brutal that is um, devastation on many different levels. I had to consider the many ways that the body is subjected and the spirit and the mind is subjected to pressures. Um, you know, we often count history through wars. It's wars that are the markers for countries of, you know, World War One, World War Two, the Vietnam War, that those are the, the markers that, that tell us where we were at certain moments as nations. Um, that's masculine. That is a way to think about a national identity that is completely based on aggression. And what if instead of valuing those moments, we actually looked at moments of community building moments of continuity, moments when societies that might have been or should have been wiped out by, by epidemics or by wars continued because um, the work of women was to sustain those communities. Uh, what would a nation's history look like if we eliminated war as a marker and looked at continuity as a way to talk? What do you think it would look like? It would center those people that history has often forgotten it would center the, the people that have never, are not used to thinking of themselves in terms of um, uh, anything worthy of remembrance. And I think that we would recognize uh, a different world if we did that. Are there opportunities for pluralism that can come when we revisit and retell the past with those bits missing? I believe that when we when we look at what has been ignored, um, power history has been constructed by people who were in power. History is a series of narratives that are often fallible, written by people who have their own biases and bad memories. Um, and what happens when we step into those moments and start looking at or considering what wasn't there initially? Um, I think it makes us more open. It makes us more open to not knowing things in the present even. And that is usually a good place to start um, for imagination. Obviously the idea of you know, what we're calling today decolonizing history or changing the narrative or adding the voices that are missing is a process that might take generations. And I wonder what you think is the, is, is the first thing that can be done to hasten that process, not just for the public at large, but especially, let's say, in the educational system? I think literature is a way to begin to um, develop our uh, better understanding of history and also our place in the present moment. I think the arts are absolutely vital. Um, to be able to read a book, um, something that we may not normally pick up, something that pushes us into different territories, something that might make us uncomfortable. I think this is a place to start. Uh, we start with ourselves. It may not happen right away. It may not happen with the first or the second or the third exhibit we go to or the, the third piece of art we look at or, or the next, you know, the fourth book that we read, but we're building something. 
We're building something in, in our imagination, which helps to dictate how we speak and how we move in the world. And I think if more people did that, there, was, there would be potential for better and more constructive conversations and education. Maza, thank you so much for answering my questions. And I really look forward to um, uh, taking questions from the audience in our live Q&A coming up a little bit later. Thank you so much. Welcome back. We're in conversation with Maza Mengiste, and this is the part of the program when we get to your questions from the audience. But before we get there, I just want to make a note that because this portion is live, there will not be any subtitling in French. However, in the post-event video, th those this portion will be subtitled. Uh, Maza, nice to see you again. Good to see you. I have a few questions from the audience, and here's one, um, some excellent questions. With the rapid proliferation of images and other cultural artifacts and discursive regimes today, how might we anticipate future generations will learn about and understand our world today? So this person gives a choice. Will official and counter narratives hold equal sway, or will history will still be written by the victors? Mm. I, uh, I'm thinking of World War II right now with that question and the research that I did, which seemed to uh, move past the accepted histories that had been saved by authoritarianism, authoritarian regimes, um, I, I discovered the, the, the people's history in a sense from journals that people left behind from the letters that they wrote to each other. And I think that for all those who are keeping journals, diaries, uh, making notes in, in, in books, in their own notebooks about what's happening, um, that's history. And that's a record that I think the future generations will look back on. 
is it that you think it might unfold differently, though, given that there is such a proliferation of information uh, in changing the narrative, the usual narrative, which is that the victor mm -hmm. ends up writing history? I think um, it's going to be, a, there's going to be a more complicated consideration of what truth is. It's going to require a layered looking, a kind of looking, one that takes time, that moves past the instant first initial gut reaction to actually layer different versions on top of each other and say, what is it that's actually happening. We have to sift through a lot of material because we are being bombarded right now, but a lot of it is repetitive. Here's another question sort of following on from that. The suppressed stories of people in many contexts have been brought to light by their subjugators, sometimes unintentionally. How can we engage with these quote unquote texts and narratives in the light of reconciliation and the restoration of justice? Mm -hmm. I think questions. one of the, it's a big question, and that's a very good question. I think one of the first steps towards reconciliation is recognition, um, to acknowledge what has happened, um, to acknowledge the existence of uh, whatever those events are, the groups of people. Um, from that, uh, there's, there is a, a sliver of justice that, that comes in that recognition. And then... Um, you know, we can begin to speak of reconciliation, but I really think that that is a more difficult step until justice has happened. And I think justice happens with acknowledgement first and then saying, how do we reckon with this history? And then after that begins the, the reconciliation process. Okay, here's another question that came quite early on. How does a country develop a shared identity when there are so many interpretations of history and efforts to manipulate the historical record? That is the million dollar question. I think we are seeing, um, we are seeing conflicts around the world right now with, uh, with different competing identities, different histories based, based on that. Um, but I do think that within those um, competing narratives, there are people who are working to bridge that gap to begin to recognize that it's not um, all or nothing, that there, it is possible for two different histories to exist within a geographical location. Um, but those histories have to be, again, recognized. The power that, that uh, has resided within that, uh, that location has to be recognized and reckoned with. Um, and we have to understand that the history that might have been popularly accepted there was a first draft of history written by those people in power. And that has to be reckoned with as well. So it's um, a series of conversations that I think realistically is very hard to begin. But I do believe that there are scholars, academics, um, writers, artists who are starting to forge the path. I was just going to ask that. Do you think the conversation is starting? Do you think it does it feel like it's started? Not everywhere. Not everywhere. But I do think in, in certain places there, there is a groundswell um, that is insisting on other histories being heard and listened to. I think we're in a very important time globally. Uh, th there's, there's a pivot that's starting to happen. We all feel it. We felt it last year um, when we were in the pandemic, uh, I mean, in lockdown, um, it's continuing. I, I think we're in the midst of it. So it's hard to gather all of the facts still but it feels like something is very different in this world. Part of, here's a question that addresses uh, um, the difficulty in, in doing exactly what we're talking about is, and the question is, and this is a big question, how does a country develop the language to be able to comfortably talk about difficult moments in history and move towards forgiveness and peace with the past? A uh, yeah, that's a really, really good question. I think, part of developing the language is developing the skills to listen, to hear what it is that is coming at you, uh, to ab absorb it, to acknowledge it, to repeat it back so that the people who are speaking understand that they have been heard. And from that, 
is created a language that can form a two-way communication. Okay, uh, here's another one. In the US, there are growing calls to exclude racial, ethnic, and cultural studies, as well as curtailments to AP world history content. What can be done to reduce these troubling trends that call for the re-erasure of pluralistic histories and unequal experiences? Uh, this is a really frightening thought and a, a frightening reality. Um, the, the thing that we have to do is continue these conversations outside of the classrooms where they might be banned, but keep those con con uh, conversations happening through literature, through the arts, through music, through dance, uh, through the writings that, that continue to come up. Um, the histories, if, if they're not in textbooks, they can be confronted in other ways. And it's, that's the work that needs to happen now. We have to, it's a grassroots um, struggle uh, for, for a narrative that acknowledges uh, all sides of history. And I know people uh, are actively engaged in that. And um, that is one thing that gives me hope that we have the writers out there and they are not staying silent. Here's a question about uh, archives and libraries. Archives and libraries are memory institutions. As you share what you have learned from using them in your research, would you please share some ideas you have for making these institutions, i.e. archives and libraries, stronger in their engagement with all communities? Yes, I, um, I know I'm not the only one saying this, but uh, digitizing these materials, uh, as expensive and as time consuming as it is, is an absolute necessity. Um, we, we have seen the way that libraries uh, in, in South Africa, as well as the museum in Brazil a few years ago, we've seen what happens when um, natural forces can, uh, can destroy important histories, important materials. We need to digitize these. There needs to be a shared, um, uh, the effort needs to be shared globally. Um, and then we need to give access for those digitized materials to people around the world, uh, regardless of payment, regardless of membership in a particular library. Um, I don't, those need to be readily available. I should not have had to go to Italy for some of the materials that I did. Uh, but imagine someone in Ethiopia trying to find this information or someone in Sierra Leone trying to access something um, in Italy, it becomes almost impossible. And those are histories that belong to, to the continent as well. Uh, I think we have maybe room for one last question. So we'll go with this one. Um, by what methods can the cultures, languages, and societies of historically marginalized people be reestablished and respected as worthy and quote, civilized? in the global narrative? First, they are worthy. Um, and, it's, uh, and if that is not being heard, uh, I think uh, it's, not, it's not on the people who have been erased or uh, subjugated. It is on the, uh, everyone else to, to begin to learn how to listen. There is no voiceless people. There are only people who don't know how to listen, who haven't learned how to do that. And we have to recognize that the effort begins with us, with all of us to hear what, has, what is being spoken. Um, and so for those groups who have been marginalized, um, you are there regardless of whether someone acknowledges it or not, you have a voice, whether someone can hear it, it's on the rest of us to listen. And that is something that we have to take on. It's not up to other people to try to teach someone how to hear them. It's a really wonderful note to end on. Maza, it's been an honor speaking with you. It's been a privilege fantastic, for me. Nala, Thank fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And for a final word, uh, we turn it over to Santa J. Ono, who's the president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia for a few uh, words of closing remarks. Thank you. It is an honor to be asked to provide a few closing remarks at today's annual pluralism lecture. Cette série de conférences représente une occasion précieuse et unique 
d'écouter quelques-uns des voix le plus distinguées et incisives se prononcer sur le pluralisme à l'heure actuelle. I'm speaking to you from the University of British Columbia campus in Vancouver, and I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I thank you all for joining us from many places, near and far, and also acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. On behalf of the University of British Columbia, thank you to the Global Center for Pluralism for giving us the privilege of hearing from the very thoughtful and inspiring Maza Meng Giste, and to CBC Ideas host Naila Ayed for your skill in drawing out so many important lines of inquiry. Reflecting on today's themes of the importance of history to belonging and pluralism, I'm struck by the important role of educational institutions alongside oral and family history. It is through educational institutions, such as our own, that history is passed down through generations. It is often within the context of education that interpretations of history are critically examined and questioned a process that helps us to uncover our biases, as well as to understand and to tell our collective history. How we come to understand our shared history can advance or erode efforts at building thriving societies that value diversity. An inclusive approach to history is therefore integral to pluralism. By encouraging excellence in research and learning at UBC, we strive to inspire people, ideas and actions for a better world. In practice, this can take many forms, but an important application of striving for a better world is to unpack and carefully consider the difficult, sometimes painful lessons from our past. By learning from those mistakes and addressing them with tangible solutions that can benefit all, we can move forward towards more pluralistic societies together. Thank you, Maza Mengiste, for giving us the opportunity to hear your boundless wisdom today and leaving us with plenty to discuss. J'espère que vous serez nombreuses et nombreux à poursuivre ces conversations chez vous et dans vous communauté ainsi qu'avec les personnels enseignants et les élèves qui vous entourent. This is certainly an ongoing discussion that I look forward to continuing with all of you. Merci. Thank you.